So the way we're going to design our electromagnetic generator is we're going to use Faraday's law of induction, which states that we can generate an EMF by having a changing flux. And we know that flux comes from the surface integral of a flux intensity over some area, or B dot dA. And so we're going to create an A. We're going to create a case, and we're going to try to make it as close to the magnet as possible. Now we have a fixed A. So we need to have a B, and we get our B from a magnet. I've tested both ceramic and neodymium magnets. The neodymium were much stronger. Uh, uh, online I found that they're, they can go between 1 and 1.4 Tesla, while ceramic are stuck at around 0 0.3. So we want a very strong B. So we went with neodymium. And now what we're going to do is we need a varying flux. So what we're going to do is we're going to mount a magnet inside our case, and we're going to rotate it. And the flux will vary. It'll be alternate. The poles will be alternating. The flux will be varying. And since the poles are alternating, we're going to have an AC generator. One thing to note when creating the generator is that the voltage will vary depending on the amount of coils we have. And that's because the flux lines are actually going to be penetrating our circuit. And so the more times it can penetrate our circuit, the more voltage we'll get. So I chose to wrap my generator with 550 wraps of coil. So we're getting 550 times the voltage as if it was wrapped once. Here we're going to show the circuits that we're going to be using. First we have just an LED on its own to check blink rate. Then we have a full bridge rectifier which we're going to use to read the DC values from our hand crank generator, which we can see right here. A moment ago we showed the LED blinking as we spun the generator so we know we're getting some output. Here we're going to hook up the motor. Since the poles are spinning so fast with the motor hooked up, it'll look like it's almost not blinking anymore, even though it is. After this, we're going to test what the AC voltage is, first by hand cranking, and then by using the motor. We're going to see, while we hand crank, we're getting about 1, 1.5, 1.8, nothing too high. And with the motor, it's about the same. We get around 4 or 5 volts. I believe that since the frequency is so low when we're rotating, these multimeters may not be detecting the correct voltage. Next, we hook up the circuit to a full bridge rectifier so that we can read the DC values off the circuit. And what we're going to find is since the DC is obviously not frequency dependent, we get really good readings and surprisingly very high voltage values that I wasn't really expecting. So hand cranking, we can get almost 14, 15 volts peak, which is quite significant. And we're going to see that when we hook up the drill, we're going to get upwards of 40, 50 volts. Unfortunately, this wasn't enough to power the Corona motor. And that's because a Corona motor, since it wants to push that negative charge out, it needs thousands of volts DC. So I'm in the process of getting a, another DC power supply, but until then, it's not possible to turn on that motor. I tried it with the Tribio electric effect with PVC and cloth, but was unsuccessful. The Corona motor is made from two pieces, a rotor and a stator. The rotor is going to be made from a pin that is mounted into a piece of wood, directly vertical, which we're going to put on top of a plastic insulated jar. So essentially what we're going to do is drill a hole in the bottom of the jar, put a little notch in the top of the jar so the pin has some the pit point of the pin has somewhere to rest and we're going to make sure that the jar can freely rotate while mounted on the pin. The stator or stationary part of the Corona motor is going to be made with four electrodes from an aluminum rotisserie pan. These electrodes are going to come in pairs, so for every positive one, there is also a negative one. We can have as many pairs as we want. And the way the Corona motor works is once we apply enough voltage to it, a negative electrode is going to shoot off a negative charge onto the cylinder. Remember, the cylinder is insulated, so the negative charge is going to want to escape from it. However, since it's insulated, it won't be able to get away. So it's going to move, it's going to begin the mechanical rotation, and it's going to ride the cylinder to, until it gets to a positive plate. 
at which point it will jump to the positive plate, but in the process it will be ionized and become a positive charge. So now we have a positive charge on a positive plate, so those will repel, it will go back to the cylinder, and it will ride the cylinder back to a negative electrode, at which point the process repeats over and over and over with a new negative electrode.